nature blessed you with a rare gift. But this royal blood comes at the price of persecution. When you feel helpless, always remember the old mage's creed. When facing a dire situation, a mage crafts the perfect spell to overcome it. Storms still rage across the ruins of the Hollow Lands. This is proof, they said. It isn't safe. It can't be controlled. Magic cannot be used. But I am a battle mage. I have broken my vow. And now I fight to break free. playing Dungeons and Dragons and reading Lord of the Rings and pretending to be wizards and the spells we created in our minds were always so much more epic than the ones we found in video games. Code Spells is a game about creative freedom, about giving the player complete control over their spells and how they work. 
every single spell can be different, and there are an infinite number of possible spells allowing wizards to really express their individuality through their magic. What makes it all possible is that Code Spells gives the player the ultimate tool for crafting spells, and that's code. In fact, Code Spells began as a research project at the University of California, San Diego. There, we ran a series of lab studies that proved Code Spells was effective at teaching kids to code and inspiring them to actually want to learn how to code. Now we've teamed up with professional game artists and programmers to make Code Spells even easier to use and even more fun. We wanted it to be a game that anyone can play, whether or not you even care about learning to code. If you just want to use the cool spells that other wizards have made, that's fine. Or if you want to delve into the mysticism of spellcrafting for yourself, you can definitely do that too. Here I'm coding a spell that lets me push rocks away from me. And as you can see, the world has real physics, so I can push a rock into other things and everything behaves realistically. This spell lets me lift rocks into the air. I can jump on the rocks and build incredibly complex things out of them. Here I've created a spell that orbits around me, and when it touches a rock, it moves the rock out of the way for me. Here's a spell that creates a tornado and lifts rocks into the air. The terrain is deformable, so you can create valleys and mountains, you can sand surf, you can terraform the entire environment. The possibilities are very literally endless. Creative Mode is a world where you can make your own spells using the elements of earth, air, fire, and water. We're building an expansive environment where these elements exist in the wild. You can explore this environment, you can terraform it, you can manipulate the elements, uh, you can customize what you see through your own creativity. Finishing the creative mode of code spells will allow us to start working on the multiplayer mode. In the multiplayer mode, you'll be able to create your own new game modes using the same coding interface you use to make spells. If you want to create a new sport, you can do that. If you want to create a new cooperative mode or a survival game, you can also do that. Our goal is to create an online multiplayer sandbox, a world populated by wizards like you. You'll be able to battle each other, and you'll be able to explore an expansive, procedurally generated world together. It's not just about exploring the place, it's about exploring the possibilities of coding your own spells. It's a great playground on its own, but more than that, it's a phenomenal tool for teaching coding. We put a lot of thought into this project. We've set it up so that we can start releasing content to you as soon as it becomes available. We want to create an open development process so that we can deliver the best possible experience. After multiplayer, we'll start working on the fifth and most challenging element, life. Adding life to the game will allow us to populate the code spells world with plants, animals, even NPCs for the wizards to interact with. Like all aspects of code spells, life needs to make sense as a cohesive system. Players will be able to observe living things interacting, will be able to communicate with them, even befriend them as familiars or mounts. We understand that life is easily the most ambitious of all the elements, but it's one that we really want to incorporate into the game. Uh, we feel like it sort of pulls all the other ones together and creates a truly living and breathing world. But it all starts with creative mode. We need your support and your feedback in order to bring the ultimate spellcrafting experience to life.
any fight left in you? Two Worlds 2 is the second attempt by developer Reality Pump to deliver a wide-open fantasy environment that's defined by its great scale and the freedom it affords you to develop your character's talents as you see fit. Like the first attempt, the game sometimes struggles under the weight of its great potential. Is the amplified power of 2 enough to hold this sprawling fantasy world together? The world has changed much in that time. Your enemies have prospered much in your absence. <laughs> After setting the narrative stage with a prison break, your somewhat customizable male hero learns that the terrible Gandohar has stolen away your sister, and presumably begun working toward the ill of the world. Before too long, the main story arc is relegated to the role of a lifeline that pops up every now and then to prevent you from getting lost in the game's almost inexhaustible supply of optional quests. Two Worlds 2 lacks a sense of real purpose, with character motivations and goals always feeling somewhat vague. But the sheer density of the world, where everyone needs your heroic help, ensures you're never short of something to do. I don't have much, but take this. Oh. <laughs> Two Worlds 2 encompasses a lot within its expansive boundaries, both in terms of sheer landmass and gameplay possibilities. Rather than developing your character within the bounds of a strict fantasy archetype, you're free to spend points to raise basic stats and improve various skills from melee and magic to stealth and crafting. There's a lot of flexibility and fun to be had in finding your ideal strategy. You'll also have a fair degree of freedom in your travels, although you'll find difficult enemies limiting your exploration. For the sake of quick back-and-forth travel between areas you've visited, you'll find teleportation devices installed throughout the landscape with great frequency, although you'll still do plenty of running around on foot or galloping through the plains on horseback. The world feels huge, but traveling around it feels manageable. In addition to your solo adventures, which easily offer dozens of hours of playtime, you can create a new character to brave the game's multiplayer experience. The adventure option takes you through a multi-stage quest with fellow players. NPCs will hand you objectives and guidance, but the real objective is to kill things and level up, which is a bit too easy if you tag along with an overpowered ally. You can also fight against other players in death matches or duels, or try your hand at city planning with a fairly in-depth village building feature. Very impressive. You sure know how to work with people. <laughs> While the land may be full of towns, traders, and individuals, an extremely high percentage of the world will want to kill you on sight. Two Worlds 2 is, as a result, largely about combat and customization. Melee combat is very active, requiring continued button presses to keep up the attack, but it demands little in the way of finesse other than deciding when to use your special abilities. Archery allows for a few tricks, such as specialized ammunition and a multi-arrow blast, but aiming and shooting are as straightforward as melee. Magic is a bit more involved. You effectively create your own spells by mixing and matching magical properties to achieve various effects, like launching elemental projectiles or summoning magical beasts. There's a great deal to the magic system in Two Worlds 2, so if you choose to specialize in spellcraft, expect to be rewarded. Earth, fire, air. No matter how you choose to attack your foes, you're likely to get a good deal of use out of the crafting and alchemy systems. You pick up a ton of loot as you go through the game, much of which isn't worth equipping or lugging back to the store. None of it is completely useless, however, since any item can be broken down into the building blocks that fuel your crafty endeavors. As for alchemy, dropping a few ingredients into a cauldron can quickly and easily create potions and tinctures that improve your chances of survival. You don't need to invest a lot of time into either system to reap its rewards, allowing you to keep your focus on the business of questing. In terms of developing your abilities, you'll have a lot of points to spend as you rapidly level in the early game, giving you ample opportunity to experiment and evolve your character. Bonus points are regularly awarded for accomplishing small goals, whether it's slaying beasts or brewing a potion, providing you with constant rewards regardless of how far off the critical path you travel. While you'll always get something for your trouble, some quests are certainly more exciting than others. There are plenty of mundane, unglamorous tasks to accompany the more heroic stuff, and actually sorting out which ones you want to focus on can be difficult. Your quest log and map, two of your most vital adventuring aids, aren't quite up to snuff. You can't tell at a glance which quests you've completed, and matching things up with your map is easier said than done. Nobody said being a hero would be easy, but it would have been nice if it were a little less annoying. I'm glad to see you made it. I was beginning to think you weren't coming.
Like other aspects of the game, the presentation in Two Worlds 2 has obvious strengths and weaknesses. Lighting and color choice work well to establish the appropriate mood, even if the game's glow is a little past being natural. Console players will also find the generally pleasing visuals stuttering and lagging as they go about their adventures, a consistent problem that they'll just have to learn to live with. Despite the smart reuse and recycle crafting system, the messy interface for accessing the game's inventory is another blemish that slightly impedes the game's playability. You'll also find that excellent combat animations flow together to create dramatic flourishes, but almost completely lack impact. No matter what you're doing, the game often feels like it's hitting and missing at the same time. Wrong place. Two Worlds 2 succeeds at creating a world of incredible breadth. There's nearly as much to explore within the game's systems as there is within its vast world. Just keep in mind that truly enjoying this adventure often requires you to overcome challenges that don't involve puzzling quests or formidable monsters. Yet even with its faults, there's a lot here to indulge your urge to explore and conquer. In another world, a more fully realized concept like this could truly be great. It's inevitable when the world falls. Each time we stamp out the darkness, it returns. Little men with their dreams of power. Through the ages, a few of us are given real power. A way to fight back against corruption and disease. We're given the means to do much more. To become much more. To become a battle mage. Sometimes, evil's too strong, and the world pays the price. We were given this power, and we failed. Will you?
The nations of the free world have fallen. All have been forced to kneel. You are a fate binder, an instrument of Kairos, the overlord that controls this world. Your will is law. You alone dictate the path of the people. You may wield an iron fist, bend with sorcery, show mercy, or crush all who defy you. Attack! Destroy them! With whom do you stand? We will carve a path to the Citadel on our own! You will pay for your treason! What will you choose, Fatebinder? The fate of a people does not always rest with a hero. Let there be light. Mind over matters. <laughs>